Minutes after the speech of Hezbollah Secretary General Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah ended on the 10th of Muharram, in which he announced the sailing of the Iranian ship loaded with diesel to Beirut, hysteria began in U.S. and Arab-funded media outlets, which considered the ship's arrival a declaration of war. One U.S.-funded MTV news outlet in Lebanon considered that the Iranian fuel ship fell like a cluster bomb and recalled the kidnapping of the Israeli soldier in July 2006, which, according to said outlet, caused a devastating war. The American ambassador in Beirut, Dorothy Shia, jumped on the first media wagon it could find on the Saudi Al Arabiya channel, blatantly responding to Hezbollah's decision to help the Lebanese people with Iranian fuel. I'm still struggling to understand as to under which law or right does this foreign ambassador have the audacity to even comment on Lebanese internal matters. But let us get to the point here. The U.S. ambassador declared that Lebanon does not need Iran's gasoline and that the U.S. has, wait for it, cleaner plans. I am currently shooting in a studio that is buying fuel three times the official price only to secure enough power to do our job in a country where the last time we ever had power grid electricity was some three weeks ago. Yet the U.S. ambassador thinks we do not need any gasoline only because we are getting it from our ally and friend, Iran. It took only one sentence by Sayyid Nasrullah. Iranian oil is on its way and all hell broke loose. Western and regional countries scrambled to ask to be allowed to help us and provide us with gas, oil and electricity, with soft and deferred loans with incredible facilities. President Michel Aoun received a phone call from the U.S. Ambassador to Lebanon, Dorothy Shia, who informed him that she was informed by a decision by the U.S. administration to help Lebanon extract electricity from Jordan through Syria. Yeah, you heard that right, through Syria. Never mind the Americans' illegal imposed Caesars Act, nor the fact that there is zero diplomatic relation between Damascus and Washington, yet Shia throws in this option only due to confusion at Sayyid Nasrallah's announcement. It does not end here. During her call with the president, U.S. Ambassador Shia pointed out that the American side is making a great effort to help Lebanon and that negotiations are underway with the World Bank to secure financing for Egyptian gas for Lebanon to repair and strengthen electricity transmission lines and the required maintenance of gas pipelines which are again located inside Syria. I just have one question here. Who delegated Shia to do all of these issues? And then she has the audacity to call the Lebanese president and tell him what solutions he should be accepting or refusing while his nation suffers the most severe economic crisis since its independence? Wow. Just wow. It is astonishing how she has suddenly contrived high morals and dedication to help Lebanon. Her intentions are crystal clear, but it's too late. Nothing will be able to block the way for Hezbollah's effort to rid its people from humiliation and despair. The first Iranian fuel ship is on its way and several others will only follow very soon. Welcome to the Middle East Dream, I'm Marwa Osman. A ship for oil derivatives is headed to Lebanon from Iran, but its arrival in Lebanon will go beyond improving the conditions of the Lebanese. It will be the first ship to ever break the fuel blockade and will establish a new deterrence equation at sea this time. Lebanon's enemies are aware of its urgent need for energy. They stand behind a large part of its crisis, whether through sieges and sanctions or through obstruction and obstacles to solutions by proxy. The Lebanese crisis is no longer bearable. When hospitals in Lebanon stop working due to the loss of electricity and the lives of the Lebanese are at risk, and when a number of them die while in queues in front of the gas stations, and when bakeries operate at minimum capacity, intervention to help becomes a national duty, even a moral imperative. This is exactly what Hezbollah did. To discuss this issue with us from Beirut is Laith Maruf, political commentator and senior media consultant. Thank you, Laith, for being with us. Now, some local and a lot of regional media as well considered the Iranian fuel ship on its way to Beirut at the moment as a cluster bomb, uh, which could 
cause, again, a devastating war, forming a forefront of opposition against this Iranian fuel ship before it even arrives and just intimidating the public with warnings of possible hysterical outcomes. Do they have valid reasons for all of this concern? Well, definitely it is a possibility that uh, apartheid Israel, the United States and its vessels uh, in the Gulf will attempt to stop this ship from reaching Lebanon. But it's a very small possibility because we've seen, uh, you know, a few months ago during the Sword of Jerusalem War in Palestine that apartheid Israel can't even take on the small resistance groups uh, located inside Gaza. And as uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, has indicated, he said that the ship right now is considered a Lebanese territory and that anyone who will basically attack this ship will uh, receive the same kind of retaliation. So we should uh, be calculating that into what had happened also in the last few weeks in Afghanistan and the humiliating American withdrawal. So it is a very small possibility that apartheid Israel or the United States will open a battle with Hezbollah that they don't even know uh, where it will end. Uh, this is, you know, they have avoided a direct war with Hezbollah over the last 10 years, 15 years since the end of the six, uh, 2006 year uh, war. And it's a very small possibility that they will do such a crazy But something move truly now. dangerous happened after Sayyid Nasrullah's uh, announcement and declaration there, uh, Laith. One local reporter uh, suggested that uh, a return to uh, Resolution 1701 was a must and called for, quote, joint operations rooms, unquote, between the Lebanese army and the United Nations be used to intercept the Iranian ship. This is a call for war there, claiming it uh, threatens the outbreak of war. So certain media outlets are calling for war to supposedly stop an act of war which does not even make any sense here clearly such calls are the u.s's first and foremost demand i'm not making this up this is what the ambassador herself is saying why is it that the u.s wants to see a war in lebanon who benefits if the country goes there well as as uh, was very apparent since 2006 uh, apartheid Israel, the United States, uh, and outside forces, outside Lebanon, cannot engage Hezbollah in a direct military confrontation. So uh, it's been since that year that uh, they have been searching for local uh, actors to start a civil war. And as we uh, heard from Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah's speech uh, on Sunday, the uh, there those who have the ability to start a civil war in Lebanon, and he's speaking about he was speaking about the uh, Sunni leadership. Some of the Sunni leadership do not want a civil war, and those who want a civil war, like uh, the Christian uh, supremacist parties, they can't afford or cannot achieve a war. So therefore, uh, what we have seen right now is. There has been an economic uh, uh, war on Lebanon since 2019, and uh, up until now, the goals that the United States set for this economic war, which is to instigate a revolt in the population against the presence of uh, resistance groups in Lebanon, has not came to fruition. Most of the Lebanese people have absorbed all these uh, shocks and awes of uh, economic uh, destabilization and have uh, not uh, revolted against uh, Hezbollah and the resistance. And in fact, uh, what uh, Sayyid Nasrallah and Hezbollah have just done with this bringing um, and on the way uh, this tanker with the oil products is uh, making those who were standing on the fence Jump uh, to the side immediately of Immediately after Sayyid Nasrallah's speech, there was a phone call between uh, U.S. Ambassador Dorothy Shia and the, and the Lebanese President Michel Aoun. And Dorothy informed him, look at the words, she informed him that the U.S. administration wants to help Lebanon extract power, electricity from Jordan, 
through Syria. Mind you, that's the same Syria that the U.S. has imposed illegal uh, seizures act against it. So anyone who deals with the Syrian government or with any Syrian uh, company that is, will be put under uh, those sanctions and suffer. How on earth is Shia planning to do so? I mean, there is zero diplomacy between the U.S. and Damascus here, and the U.S. had already imposed Caesar's Act upon Syria. How are they going to make that happen? That's the million-dollar question. I mean, she is offering the moon and the sun the day after uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah announces the, bring, you know, the ship on the way. Uh, with these huge projects of uh, connecting the electric grid from Jordan to Syria to Lebanon, connecting the gas pipelines from Egypt to Jordan to Syria to Lebanon. Again, huge projects uh, that will take uh, six months to a, to a year. That is, if there is and any that will cost millions and millions of dollars that Lebanon does not have. Exactly, and she said that she's speaking to the IMF to fund this uh, project. So, oh, thank you, more debt. Yes, please. Ex exactly, and what's funny about it, and uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah in his speech on Sunday pointed out, is that this shows that there was governments because this project has been talked about for years, uh, Jordan and Egypt that were willing to help Lebanon, but the United States has been vetoing such a project. So what needs to happen is that the United States lifts its veto on cooperation between countries in the region and allow the Lebanese economy to integrate with the countries around it, which it should be. And the only obstacle in the way is American interference and veto. So um, Ambassador Shea basically exposed herself by saying that uh, she's willing to do this project. Mm -hmm. and, well, uh, look like we will talk more about this in the second segment, but first let's go and watch this report and uh, talk more about how this Iranian ship will be an actual lifeline for all Lebanese people after this break. It became necessary for the U.S. to make Hezbollah pay the price of the strategic role it had played in preventing the fall of Syria and striking the strategic structure of the Takfiri groups in Iraq as well. Added to that, Hezbollah's extended hand to the Yemeni brothers who are facing a colonial legacy that is more than 100 years old. Above all, Hezbollah's role in uniting the resistance forces in Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. Now, today, the Americans, along with France, Britain, and Germany, in cooperation with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, are using their old Lebanese tricks, which are political parties, feudal leaders, religious leaders, and academic institutions, and the new ones, civil activism institutions and NGOs, in an effort to attain one goal implementing the strategy of tension with maximum pressure against Hezbollah and therefore against Lebanon. Iranian fuel lifeline for Lebanon in this following report. They will just get used to it, is a phrase attributed to Central Bank Governor Riyad Salemi commenting on the Lebanese people's dealing with the collapse of the value of their lira has sadly become the constitution of the majority of the power forces in Lebanon. Two years ago, Lebanon went through three major economic shocks. The shock of the bankruptcy of the banking sector, which is reluctant to declare its bankruptcy, the shock of the collapse of the Lebanese lira and then lifting subsidies, and the shock of the power and fuel outages across the country. Each of these shocks is enough on its own to destroy an economy, even if it is a strong one, and to destroy the population's livelihood capabilities. The lifting of subsidies cannot take place, even in the most brutal capitalist systems, without a social safety net. Even the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and other institutions of the capital system in the world recommend that the decision to eliminate subsidies for basic commodities be simultaneous with social protection programs for the most vulnerable classes. Successive shocks that hit the population of Lebanon coupled with the global pandemic of corona, the explosion of the port and a continuous political crisis which produced irregularities in the constitutional institutions like government vacuum, presidential vacuum and parliamentary extension 
that consumed more than half of the past 16 years. The reality is more like an undeclared war. In this regard, unconventional solutions must be found, foremost of which is securing energy sources in the face of monopoly and siege and bypassing the complete impotence of institutions. Emergency procedures aimed at resuscitating the patient and preventing his death. Here lies the importance of importing oil from Iran. It is not a solution to the crisis in Lebanon, but it is certainly a lifeline in the face of the internal and external forces of death. <laughs> Importing oil from Iran is neither a challenge nor an internal competition. Rather, it provides oxygen to Lebanon at a moment when many wants it to be completely strangled. Lebanon has many emergency options which the authority could have resorted to to mitigate the severity of the collapse in parallel with working on a reform plan that would halt the collapse and rebuild the system in an effective manner. Common sense says that the state should arm itself with the decision of the resistance and rely on it to impose alternative economic options that support the living capabilities of the population. However, the reaction of Washington and those in its orbit indicate a confrontation that they want the people to pay to push them back from their pro-resistance stance. Opening a fuel lifeline from Tehran to Beirut to import gasoline and diesel will produce effects that will mitigate the consequences of the crisis. Even if it does not constitute a comprehensive solution to it, it is the first attempt in Lebanese history to break the power of cartels and greedy importers, as well as a first break of the American decision to increase pressure on Lebanon. Now we continue from Beirut with Leith Marouf, political commentator and senior media consultant. Leith, the United States decided to fight all battles to prevent Hezbollah's plans to lift its people and uh, with it the entire country, uh, by the way, from the grip of all sorts of cartels, notably the fuel cartels and the pharmaceutical cartels, including preventing oil support from Tehran to reach Lebanon. Whether it is by sea, by land, by any means, they just don't want to see that help coming to the Lebanese people. What do you think will happen if Shia actually succeeds in pushing the Lebanese government into banning the Iranian ship from entering Lebanese waters? Look, it is a very big if because, uh, as we have seen, the major parties that are in power in Lebanon that are allied with Hezbollah, that control the majority in the parliament, control the president's office, Ha, are actually welcoming uh, the arrival of this tanker. So what we would, the only way that this could happen is if there's a coup by the military, the Lebanese army, uh, against the president and the parliament and against Hezbollah. It's very this, dangerous. Then. And that's very dangerous. And we know that the United States has been pushing towards this confrontation between the military of Lebanon and Hezbollah, and they haven't had a success yet. And I doubt that even if uh, General Aoun, in charge of the military, decides to follow the dictates of the United States, I doubt his soldiers will follow him. And that's because the actual composition of the Lebanese army is is a reflection of the population of Lebanon and that means that the majority of his own soldiers will refuse him. So this is a big if and uh, I, you know, w w w sanctions might be waived as a weapon against everybody in this country and w you know, w this is the last uh, weapon uh, that's left uh, at the table of the United States to sanction the politicians of Lebanon as a whole, the whole government. And that will just uh, drop everybody in the resistance basket, basically. And, and nobody will uh, be affected by anything beyond that, any control of the United States. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword for the United States to threaten, number one, that the military uh, take on Hezbollah and this tanker uh, coming from Iran, and or to sanction the whole uh, political elite in Lebanon, because then it will have zero influence over uh, the, the situation on the ground. Well, we have all these anti-resistance parties like the regimes and governments all across the region and the world as well, working according to one theory, that the defeat of Hezbollah now requires two things. One, to disband its allies, that's through th sanctions, whatever the cost is, and then create tensions resulting from the living crisis that Lebanon is passing through wherever they are and 
at whatever the cost as well. Tension is very easy to create in a country like Lebanon. We could just start a fight right now at the gas station outside this studio where people are gathering to try and get gasoline. But what will the U.S. be able uh, or how will the U.S. be able to disband Hezbollah's main allies in Lebanon? And if so, do you think that uh, maybe uh, the first party uh, to fall uh, from this alliance would be which one here? Do you have one in mind? I personally think that the parties that are aligned with Hezbollah have taken a decision to be loyal and Hezbollah has shown its loyalty no matter how much under pressure it came because you know Hezbollah is the only party that has no corruption um, at all that anybody can point at. Right now the biggest uh, worry that we should uh, look at uh, here is is not uh, uh, that you know, some people will have a fight at a gas station or outside a bakery. Uh, the the problem that we should be all worried about is the entry of uh, an external power into the battle here. And this is, you know, we look at the last uh, 15 years and we know that the major players that could have a civil war with Hezbollah are not capable of doing such. Therefore, the only thing that we should be worried about is the possibility of an external war. Well, evident to your uh, to your words here late, just last week there was a trending on social media in Lebanon where a lot of the anti-resistance uh, people who maybe support the Lebanese forces, the Jaja, uh, political affiliated uh, forces, they were calling through social media for the intervention of the NATO and foreign forces to rid them from what they are calling the Iranian occupation. This is beyond what one can believe, but it did happen. So you can actually feel how much of the investments of the U.S. Embassy are taking their toll on the Lebanese society. Yes, there were not that high. I mean, you could you could study the trends in Lebanon, but at the same time, it was using it was being used in English language, and they all were using specific words like immediate intervention, like Iranian occupation, like rid us from terrorism, for example. So, what do you make of, out of all of this? They're talking to their white master, and this is actually shows you how weak I, I they are. I love your terminologies. <laughs> this it shows you how weak they are. They can't talk to the Lebanese population and such. This propaganda doesn't work anymore. And they're addressing their master. And the funny part is that this is happening during the American defeat withdrawal from Afghanistan True. with those historic images that we saw. And so, you know, they can bark, uh, but their master is not going to come to help them because they will not risk uh, something worse than Afghanistan. Well, they were actually beaten up uh, word-wise, uh, verbally, by the uh, American ambassador who uh, reprimanded her NGO representatives as a result of the utter failure of the August 4 and uh, the August 4 plan for Lebanon. And she reiterated her request to focus on the danger of Hezbollah. Uh, and I'm, I'm, these are talking points coming out of the meeting that she had. I'm not making this up. You can find it in Lebanese media. Unfortunately, we may witness many events that reflect this American understanding of chaos, such as bloody confrontations in more than one uh, Lebanese uh, region, especially regions where it's mixed with different sects, or maybe uh, motorized uh, media campaigns or even judicial procedures, in addition to great pressures to prevent Lebanon from obtaining any kind of direct or indirect support unless it is controlled by the West. In one minute, is Lebanon on the brink of war or has the U.S. completely lost Lebanon? Look, uh, this, uh, you know, the response of the ambassador came after the speech on Friday when Sayyid Nasrallah announced the coming of the first ship. We've moved past that. So everything that she's done is useless now because already by Sunday, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah announced the second ship on the way and also raised the stakes and said, there is oil and gas in the waters, territorial waters of Lebanon. And if the international companies that the United States controls are not willing to extract, that they will bring Iranian companies to do so. so well, this <laughs> has got to bring out media frenzy. And I'm just looking forward to what will happen during this week when the ship actually arrives on it. Thank you very much, Leith Maruf, political commentator and senior media consultant for being with us and discussing this. I will be willing to discuss this more with you when the frenzy touches a new level. Thank you for being with us and thank you for watching. Please stay tuned next week for more from the Mideast stream.